do what we do. And we're going to include go, talking about Luis Alfaro's work and with him about his work. And then, of course, he's going to take questions from you. But first of all, for those of you who have never been to Watch Me Work Mature, I'm Susan Lee Parks. We start Watch Me Work by saying thank you to the Public Theater and thank you to Howl Round. I've been doing this show for 11 years, mostly in the lobby of the Public Theater. And they've been supporting me the whole time. And then a couple, a few years ago, Howl Round came on to help us live stream when we were doing it live out of the lobby of the Public Theater. And now Howl Round and the Public Theater have joined forces to create this beautiful uh, opportunity that we have. Um, we were doing it every day and now we're doing it four days a week um, because we love you and we want to provide support encouragement and you know sometimes some ass kicking to help you to help you uh just be uh every day so um so what we're gonna do is we work for 20 minutes and then we talk to luis alfaro about his work but first but first, you must hear, if you don't know, or if you like are you know, having a, a brain fart moment and you don't know a lot about Luis Alfaro, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you. Um, Luis Alfaro is a Chicano writer known for his work in poetry, in theater. He writes also short stories. He's a performer and he's a journalist, right? He spent six years as the playwright in residence at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival from 2013 to 2019. He was a member of the Playwrights Ensemble at Chicago's Victory Gardens Theater from 2013 through 2020. I guess it just wrapped up, Luis, right? Um, he's a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Award, a MacArthur Fellowship Award, which means he's superiorly awesome and intelligent and <laughs> genius-like, genius-ish. Um, and, oh, and also, oh, last year was a big year for him. Last year, he was awarded the Penn America Laura Pell's International Foundation Theater Award, okay? And he was awarded the United States Artist Fellowship. And he was awarded the Ford Foundation's Art for Change Fellowship. So he was, he was, he is very much happening. His plays and performances include Electricidad, Oedipus El Rey, Mojada, Delano, and Body of Faith, just to mention a few. He has spent, Luis has spent over two decades in the Los Angeles poetry community, touring North and Latin America mm. as a performance artist. Also, he's a righteous, righteous brother. Um, and we're thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have him. And we always have good conversations. I'm looking to forward to working with you, Luis, and all of our Watch Me Work community. We're gonna work for 20 minutes together. Then we're gonna talk to Luis about what he's working on and some of his specific concerns. And then I'll get out of the way and Luis will take questions about your work and your creative process from all y'all. Okay, so if you wanna get in touch, if you have a question, Audrey's gonna tell us how to get in touch. Thanks, SLP. Thanks, Luis. So nice to see you um, both. Um, so if you have a question and you're inside of the Zoom, all you need to do is click on the raise your hand button, likely in a participant tab at the bottom of your screen on a laptop at the top if you're on an iPad or a tablet. And if you're watching on HowlRound.tv, you can tweet at us at, at WatchMeWorkSLP with the hashtag HowlRound, H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D. Um, and you can also tweet at Public Theater NY or write to us in our Instagram. And those are all the ways. All the ways lead to the sea. All the ways lead to the sea. Here we go. We got 20 minutes. Ready, Audrey? And, yeah. Ready, and here we go.
All right. All right, all right. Here we are. Here we are. We got some questions. Hope you guys got some work done or enjoyed the sunshine or wherever you're at. Um, we got some questions for Luis, and then we're going to have him take your questions about your work and your creative process. We always start, Luis, with... Look, you're so beautifully lit. Um, is that a, like a, a special effect on your face or something? No, I have to admit that. Uh, can you hear me? You hear me, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have to admit that I I read that New York Times article from, from Tom Ford about how to light yourself on Zoom. Oh. <laughs> so I copied it exact. I did everything he told me to do. So my my computer is actually on a box, an egg box. I like I made my 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 ghetto version of it. But it is really cool. <laughs> wow, it looks yeah, it's like it's gorgeous. It's like this and 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 you, are you in a dark room or something? I mean, what is this? I am in my bedroom in Koreatown. Uh -huh. And it's kind of lit, but the, he's right about like if you get one light to kind of, you know, be your primary light. He had a whole list of look it up. It's so good. That's so amazing. <laughs> I mean, I, I know I feel so like underprepared sitting in the sun. I thought that could be my light. Well, I'm very jealous. I'm very jealous. Look at you. Look at you. So tell us, what you, what are you working on right now, man? Well, I'm working on a couple of things. I mean, maybe my biggest thing right now is I'm doing a play for a company called Bob Baker Marionette Studio, oh. the longest running puppet company in the, the United States. Uh -huh. And I thought I'd tell you the very quick little story because oh. it's typical of how I work. So um, they invited me to come see their show. They do an hour show. It was about 150 uh, kindergarten to second grade kids. Uh -huh. And so, you know, it's like they sit on the floor. It is amazing. Bob Baker himself, who passed away, was a, a really kind of extraordinary guy. And the whole show is a, a soundtrack kind of like from the 70s. So like one of, there's a cat who performs and it's Liza Minnelli singing. <laughs> <laughs> so you can just imagine. And then there's a clown that comes out and he's on a little stage. Oh. The stage is on a turntable, it turns, and he's at his dressing table and he sings, send in the clowns. I mean, it is so corny, right? And so beautiful. So kids are getting one thing, adults are getting another. So after the show, they said, um, can you come backstage? We're going to show you where we work and the whole thing. And I went and then they said, we have a little documentary we want to show you. And the documentary was a uh, film, those old film projectors from school. Remember those with the reel? Yeah. And uh, so they put on the film and it was a documentary about two kids from L.A., urban L.A., oh. a little girl and a little boy who had extreme stutters. Oh. And these kids would go every week to the Bob Baker Marionette Studio and talk to the puppets. And that is how they were cured of their stuttering. Wow. So as we're watching the documentary, the little boy starts talking. Then under, you know, they have a little title for the boy and it says Luis Alfaro. And I was like, oh, my God. And he said, is that you? And it, uh, I only recognize myself because my mother used to make my clothes and she used to make me these cool Nehru collar shirts. <laughs> I was super into the Beatles and um, I was, it was me and I was the little kid who had the extreme stutter. And so they said, you have to do this play. And I was like, wow. absolutely. So I was thinking about that because wow. I had just gone to a TCG conference where Andre De Shields had spoken and he said, um, I, one of the wish, one of the things I wish I knew earlier was not every job that comes your way is your job is meant for you, you mm -hmm. know. But this felt like this was really, really meant for me, <laughs> right? It sounds yeah. fantastic. It sounds fantastic. Wow. Yeah. So how? Um, so did you write a? You're writing a play about a little yourself? puppet, a little girl puppet, a little Latina puppet that stutters. Was wow. a, a, and it's really getting in the way of her performance. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. yeah. So, you know, I think sometimes these jobs come and it's so interesting because I am one of those people who's been really sheltering in place religiously. I live in Koreatown, which is the oh. densest neighborhood in Los Angeles. Oh, so, you know, I really have to take care of myself. And um, I'm, I, that piece is really about isolation, right? It's about not, not being able to speak, not being able to communicate. And then I'm writing a piece about a seminary. So I think it's very interesting that these pieces come to us when they come to us, right? And uh -huh. they come to us because of where we're at in our lives. 
So um, yeah, it's been very it's been very moving to write. It feels like they're coming along very easily, partly because I'm feeling the moment, right? And I'm feeling my way through the moment. Uh huh. Uh huh. What about that advice? Like, not all work is yours that comes. You could, re could you repeat that again? That's really really. Sure. That not every job, not every job that came my way was was meant for me. And I really think since sometimes, you know, somebody will approach you about something, you'll think, oh, my God, I really want this commission. But the truth is, <laughs> it's not really yours, right? So a lot of times I've been in really beautiful situations where I'll say, um, yeah, it's just not the thing that's right for me, but I know who it's right for, right? Uh -huh. And I want to, you know, I want to connect you. So I think a lot of times we are the connective tissue through our industry, right? Uh, and, uh, and that we create a bigger, bigger community because... That every job is, you know, you can tell when it's your job. You know, I can tell when I'm super excited and super passionate and that first draft just shoots out of you, right? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you're like, hmm, I'm for hire right now. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm like struggling through this, right? I hear you, I hear you. Wow, that's really, no, that's really, really important for folks to hear and even for, for me to hear, it's really helpful. So you're an activist also, also. And how does your activism inform your work, if it does? How so? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, abs activism is about uh, uh, having a point of view, right? It's about obsession in some ways for me. It's about righting a wrong. It's about engaging in something that I know I should be engaged with. Uh -huh. So for me, um, I find that, you know, I use this, art this artist citizen term a lot, and I really believe it. I'm an artist. But I'm really also a citizen. I'm very involved in my community. I'm very involved in my communities, right? And um, I think that this moment is a really good uh, example of it. You know, I've been very involved in, you know, conferences and these Zoom calls and all that, but also, you know, just calling theaters out and having conversations and working with artistic directors and talking about the moment and what we're going to do about it and yeah. how we're going to move through it. And I think that really comes from uh, being a creative person, right? And being, uh, so for me, being an artist is also about how do, I, how do I get immersed in my community and how does the community tell me the story that needs to be told? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I love when I go to a new community or I go somewhere on a residency and, and uh, rather than telling people what I do, I always say, listen, I am the most ignorant person in this room. Tell me what I need to know about your community. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Tell me what I need to know. So like in, this, in the same way, you know, the other day I was having a com conversation with somebody in my, my neighborhood and I know things about my neighborhood. I know that about this dance thing, right? I know that, that we have a, how, what my community is composed of. Uh, you know, 93% of the people in my community are renters. We are essential workers. When I get up at 5.30 in the morning, I am getting up with people in uniforms going to work, right? I'm getting up with people who are going to be of service. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times along those lines, that is one of the ways that the stories come to us, right? From the mm -hmm. place we're at. So where are you from? Mm -hmm. Who are your people? Mm -hmm. Are really, really important questions for me, mm -hmm. right? And how people? does your neighborhood work? Oh, I'm sorry, I was, I was jumping. No, that's okay. How does your neighborhood work? How does your neighborhood work, right? Huh, huh. What about people who say like, hey, it's 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 enough for me just to get my plays done. I mean, I don't need a whole nother. What, what do you say to that? I mean, is that is that valid to your mind? Absolutely. I mean, everybody comes from a different place. I will say that my play is my um, conversation that I'm having with either. I've kind of talked about this a little bit with myself. It's a play for me is a conversation that I'm either having with God, mm. with a lover, or with myself. Mm -hmm. And each one of those is a kind of different kind of play. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. But when I think about it that way, the God plays are really about what's going on in the world and right. what is my place in the world and how do I make a better world? I go to the theater to learn how to be a better person, right? right. So if that is in fact the case, how do I, how do I translate, channel, interpret this moment that I'm in? So I studied with Irene Fornes, that was my mentor, right? And Maria Irene Fornes used to say to me, you know, uh, there were a lot of great artists before you, a lot of great artists after you. All you have to do right now is just tell the story of today. 
And part of why she used to say that is because I would put everything in my play. Like my plays had family and blood and lust and everything, right? And she would say, relax, relax, right? If you see yourself, not just in the one play, but in a lifetime of many plays, 50 plays, let's say, 25 plays, mm -hmm. you can relax into every play, allows you to say one thing about the world that you're in, the moment that you're in right now, right? Mm -hmm. And I love that because in a way, I do myself need to relax into the moment. Mm -hmm. So I love when I'm able to focus the energy into the play and just the play is a slice of the pie, right? And not the whole the whole thing, right? So I don't have to say the entire entire story of everything. But I love that. I think for me, it's just a way of saying slow down, mm -hmm. meditate. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, you know, I think one of the things we we don't do in, enough as as writers is uh, conceptualize mm -hmm. the dream state, right? We call it the I call it the dreaming state. I, we don't do enough of that to sit with myself and think about what is it that's really really troubling me. What is the thing that I want to activate in the play? What do I want to bring into the play? And so activism, taking an active interest in my community is a way of always being interested, of being full of inquiry, of idea, right? Without feeling like I have to invent anything. Mostly I'm just trying to get out of the way. Right? Uh-huh. Well, mostly you're trying to get out of the way, but when you're in, when you're a performer, right, and you're like on stage, you're at, you're totally in the, you're totally in it, you're, to, you're totally present and visible. And how does that, if at all, does it change the way you write or not? How does that affect your writing? Sure. I mean, there's a couple of things here that I think are really interesting about having done performance and then also writing. One is that when I get ready to do performance, I always think about tennis players. You know how they talk to themselves before they before they get into that match? Uh -huh. I do this thing where I say to myself, just tell the truth, get out of the way, just tell the truth, you know what you have to do, just get out of the way, right? So really I kind of relax into a performance. The other thing I, I believe very strongly about performance, and I learned this from another mentor, Morgan Jeunesse, oh, who, yeah. who said to me, you know, um, I needed to focus more on the 3D, the dimension of space, to think about theater in terms of, of um, the dynamics of space. And I think as a performer, you're trying to fill space. So I studied a lot of performance art and we had this concept called deliberation, I love it. In the act of doing nothing, you are always doing something. In the act of doing nothing, you're always doing something, you're already performing. And the other, the other idea for, for me about performance was, uh, what is the space that needs you the most? Move towards the space that needs you the most. Move towards the character that needs you the most, right? So in a way, those are concepts about performance that I love bringing into writing, right? What needs me the most right now? What in my story is not dynamic enough? What is not being filled in? Where is that corner? Where is that space that that has energy that I'm not taking advantage of? That's interesting, right? Because I think for me, I think that's the way I work. I get up in the morning, I think, what is the space that needs me the most? How do I fill that space today? It's very Pentecostal too, so I was raised very religious. And uh, you know, one of the Protestant ideas is, right, service. But I love that. How can I be of service today to my own work? How can I be of service to the writing? I must do it. I must practice the religion of writing. So let me move towards the thing that needs me the most today. I'm talking. What do you do when it's hard to practice the religion of, of writing? I mean, it's. Yeah, it's I mean, some days hard. I teach. So, you know, teaching is hard because it's hard to teach and write. Mm -hmm. Other, I'm looking at Lisa Demore, so I'm like, oh my God, you know, I just, my God, my heart goes out to, you know, those of us that are in the academy, right? Because it's hard. I think one of the things that I've gotten very good about is um, I steal a lot of exercises. I have this crazy little exercise in the morning. I call it my, my aerobics of the morning. I have a little Vons market box, recipe boxes, and I have an object, an action, and a line. 
And every morning I get up and I pull out an object, mm -hmm. I pull out an action, and I pull out a line, and I write a, at least a 10, mm -hmm. you know, 10 exchange little scene mm -hmm. just to get me writing, right? Just to get me in the movement of writing. Mm -hmm. So I love things like that. I love the, the research of writing a play. So I think a lot of times people will say, well, you haven't written in a long time. And I'll say, well, actually, I feel like all I'm doing is writing. I'm getting in pregnant with the possibility of this play. All I'm doing is researching, right? Uh -huh. So I love, I love the details and the facts. You know, I'm spending a lot of time right now just thinking about seminaries and how they work and why is a Catholic church getting rid of so many? And, you know, I'm reading all the articles. That is essential to the writing. Mm -hmm. That is writing. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I keep looking at I, you like, like I keep looking I'm at you smiling. for permission. <laughs> I'm not, no, I'm I'm smiling and I love you. Um, I I I don't want to get into the conversation about that right now. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, mean, I want to take you out for a virtual glass of wine and talk about that. But um, I feel like taking some questions for our from our fabulous group here. Go of ahead. Of course. Anybody have any questions for Luis? Hey team, does anybody have, oh, we got a question. All right, Russell, you are up first. Are you there? Yes, right here. Uh, great to be here, great to meet you. Um, a big note that I've been getting recently has been some of my secondary uh, characters feel like they're only really there to serve uh, the protagonist. I was wondering if you could share some insight or uh, techniques to really like flesh out those secondary characters and make them feel fuller and three-dimensional? I love this question because it's something I wrestle with a lot myself. I will say that I subscribe to, um, I have this book, this little thin book that I would suggest everybody get called The Presence of the Actor by Joe Chaikin, Joseph mm -hmm. Chaikin. And I love it because inside of this book, he has seven questions and the questions are about how actors create a character. For me, I use them for how I create a character in a play. And the first question for me is so beautiful. What is the one thing that people cannot see when they look at you? Ooh. What is the one thing that people cannot see when they look at you? Is there a part of you that has not lived yet? What would make that part live? I, one, what, how wonderful and active are these questions for characters, right? It's in a way you're creating backstory, you're creating nuance of character, you're creating the logic um, that manifests into a character's action. Does that make sense? Oh, so yeah. that the character is not just there to serve, but the character is a fully fleshed, interesting person that is contributing to the play in an essential way. So I love, get that book, because that book is so good, right? Uh, what, was the, what was the title again? It's called The Presence of the Actor, Joseph Chaikin. I wish we could go on and do a whole Chaikin, because um, he was extraordinary. He was really extraordinary, yeah. And, uh, and the other thing, I, the other exercise I use a lot is um, Irene Fornis had an exercise, which was take your character's age and cut it in half. Look at that half age. Something happened to that character at that age that determines how they, how they move through the world. And so your characters are acting a certain way because they live a certain way or they see the world a certain way. Oh, and so all of a sudden it makes your characters opinionated, right? And we need opinions on stage. <laughs> <laughs> we need a lot of opinions. We need people to try to interrupt the flow of the play. We want the play to have that kind of energy, right? The energy that is unpredictable, that creates wonderful, wonderful rhythms, right? And the way people respond to one another. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. I never thought about that. Oh, wow, that's Beautiful awesome. to meet you, beautiful to meet you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Russell. Um, all right, we don't have another question quite yet, but I bet we will if we wait momentarily. What do you like to write? Uh, do you have a favorite medium? I mean, you write short stories, you write plays, you write lots of things. What's your favorite favorite 
kind of thing to write. Do you have one? Well, it's funny. I think that the community I loved the most was the poetry community because there was no money involved. <laughs> and you know, you, it was really a community, right? Um, but I think I found my, my alchemy was really in playwriting. I think it took a long time to find that. I studied with Irene for a long time and also, you know, Paula Vogel used to come to LA every year. And so like Paula, and there's been a lot of people in my life that uh, have helped me make sense of writing. But I think I find my strength or at least I find my passion in playwriting. I wrote a screenplay that took me two years and uh, it was a whole, you know, it was interesting to learn how to write screenplays. And I was very happy, you know, and, and it got made into a film and the whole bit. And every time I get a check, I still get checks for it, which is amazing, right? And every time I get a check, I think, wow, I got to go back to that form. But it's not my passion. I would say that theater is where I find my full expression. I do have, um, I, I, if there's no other question, I do have- Here, a, we, got, we have a couple questions if you- if oh, you, okay, go for it, go yeah, for it. Yeah. Um, all right, Carla, you are up next. Hello, hi, Luis, hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, I apologize, you. there's music in the background because I'm from, I'm in Washington Heights and the party's outside. Um, <laughs> and I live on the first floor. Um, but I guess my question is, I've, seen, I've seen Mojada and um, uh, Eripos El Rey. Um, and I guess my question is, I'm writing something that includes a bit of magic and sort of mysticism and stuff like that. And so I'm wondering, I know it probably includes some research, but I'm wondering how much do you uh, make up or extend the bounds of like the okay. magic that you're with? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I have to just say something really quick. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw sure. this at Susan Laurie for a second because my delivery guy is here and he's at the door. So I'm gonna run really <laughs> fast. I'll be right back. Laura, Susan Laurie, take it. Oh, my, my. <laughs> in a van and he comes back because that's okay because it, it's a question for him what i want to know is what he's getting you know like mm. who is like like is it like takeout is it something from yeah. the evil empire amazon or is it ha ha you see i just oh vamped, i just vamped. you got to answer this question because this is a question for you man I love this. Yes, I, I feel that um, for me, the, the classics are really just parameter. I, I really don't have it. I don't have a lot of loyalty to them. For me, it's I use the classics mm. as a way of learning how to be a better writer because they're so beautifully put together. But the other thing is they yeah. ask really big questions. And sometimes I think as a Chicano, I will I will admit that sometimes I get lost in the smaller questions of community. So how do I keep asking the big questions about my identity, about who we are as a people, about um, what we're trying to say at this moment in our culture, right? So I think, you know, mm, using, yeah. using the classics that way is really, really important for me. I love being inspired by um, the idea that I don't have to stay in any one box. So going to the Greek mm. really takes me outside of myself, right? Going to the Greeks is as far away from me as possible. So that's part of the reason why I have been using it. But they've all come out of very specific community experiences. So Electricidad was because I, I was doing a project with uh, teen felons. Oedipus was because I did a residency at Kern State Prison. And Mojada was because mm. I, you know, I was writing about the undocumented in Daly City in, in near San Francisco. So all of them really came out of something personal and local for me, but they, and then they mm. jumped into the bigger idea, right? What's the big question? Mm. Why is it that yeah. we still suffer from the violence of poverty the way we do? Why is it that we mm. still destroy each other as a community, right? So in a way, uh, yeah. I think if, it, if you can use it that way, use it that way. But I, I would mm. caution that the one thing I say is, you know, don't stay so loyal that it that your voice gets lost. It's your point of view. It's your point of view that we want to see, right? Um, Ann Bogart just said something really interesting at this panel the other day. She said, the three things we need right now in the culture is passion, point of view, and craft. 
and that she felt very strongly that our point of view had gotten too narrow, right? And I thought, oh, this is really, really important. How, how do I open it up? How do I keep opening myself up? And how do I see myself as a world artist? How do I see myself? Um, I always write from this corner right here in Koreatown, but, but I see myself as a resident of the world. And that shifts me, that shifts the writing. It makes the writing bigger. It makes it bolder. It makes it more uh, fantastical, right? Magic, mm -hmm. magic. Yeah. So the magic then makes sense. Does that make sense? Like uh, my magic, yeah. I'm doing this play right now at the seminary. Uh, there's a guy in it who, uh, who has never left the seminary, like literally never left the, the, his room. Well, you know, I wow. don't know. I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> There's magic to the experience of what I'm trying to bring into that about faith. What do we believe? And I think that's such a joyful thing to bring to the theater. What do we believe when we walk into this place that we're all going to share, this religious site that we're all going to, this, this spiritual experience we're going to have called theater, right? How much are we willing to yeah. join it? Does that help at all? Yeah. Yeah. I, it does it does it's because i'm i think it's because the the thing i'm writing i the magic i'm like filling with it but um it's not connecting with the real characters and so it's great that i guess for me it's i guess i started backwards i started thinking about the magic and not so much about the character and how that yeah, relates so, to the real world so this yeah. is something i think about mm -hmm. a lot and i wonder you know this is something i've always wanted to ask susan laurie is i tend to hardly ever think about plots and I always think about character, and great characters give us great stories, right? I'm not sure that great stories ever give me great character. So I'm always, a, you know, I'm always a little lost that way. But I will say that magic has logic. And, I, and somebody I admire very much is Diana Sun, the writer, because I, I love the way she heard magic. It always has so much logic to it, right? It will make sense. It, it, yeah, eventually. Lisa is saying magic has logic. I believe that completely. Magic has logic. Yeah, there, it, there is a thread, right? There is a beautiful thread that comes out of it, right? So everything has a kind of sense of logic attached to it. But you have to do the work. It's a building. And there's architecture involved, especially in magic. If it floats, how does it float? But you, it could also float through faith, right? It could just be that. Beautiful, beautiful. Hey, Luis. Thanks, Carla. Um, we've got about eight minutes left, um, and we're going to go to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, are you there? Oh, mute. I'm unmuted. I guess. Oh. Hi. Hey. Hello. Um, I'm curious about how you approach rewrites. Yes. Well, I believe the art of writing is rewriting. So for me. When I go into rewrites, I try to do that thing that my doctor says I shouldn't do in real life, but I should do in the theater, which is to compartmentalize. <laughs> I laugh about it because, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's what's gotten us in trouble in the culture. But in playwriting, I think it's very good to compartmentalize. By that, I just mean when I go back into a rewrite, I follow a character. I follow a thread. Does that make sense? Yes. I follow the logic of a character through. So right now I'm really wrestling with what's happening to somebody who a lot of things are happening to that person, right? Okay. And how is that person in this play the activator of, of these events, right? So in a way, my rewrite is just writing through that character. What am I missing in that character that is making that character so passive? When did that character run out of opinion? And that's my lead. So there's a problem, right? And so I would say that I have to activate the character through something as beautiful as the passionate idea. Why am I here? Why is this play happening in this moment right now? Okay. Right? Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. So I love, I love rewriting that takes character all the way through an experience then you know I write a lot way more than I ever need but I feel that then I really really understand the character and the authenticity of that character because I've really invested in um, who, who they are in the world and what they believe about the world and then out of that interesting little you know detours happen that sometimes become more interesting than the play itself okay thank you 
Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Louise. Big glasses. Um, All right, we're going to go to Melina. Melina, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Louise. Hi, Melina. Uh, My goodness, I haven't seen you so long. I know. Um, So uh, you're such a wonderful storyteller, and you know, and you're such a you love to rewrite like through the process. And I've never asked you this. Can you talk about how you approach performing, even though it's your own work? Is there a point when you say, okay, I've got to stop rewriting this and think about, you know, like work. I mean, how, can you talk about the performing aspect of, of your work? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't improvise. I'm not a good improviser and I would never do that. So I like having a finished, a finished as finished as it can be text. Right. I Mm -hmm. love the idea that I reach the end of a sentence almost in my writing. So when I'm, when I'm working on a play with other actors and I was just talking about this at the public, because, you know, they were like, wow, you wrote, rewrote all the way through. And I said, yeah, because I, I write to the actor. I write to the actor's voice. So sometimes I change the language of my play, not the story of my play, but the language because the actor sounds better saying certain words, if that makes sense. And for in performance, I'm very conscious of how I use language, right? So I do get to a moment where I stop. Things get deeper uh, the more you repeat the experience. So a good example is the last thing I did was this piece called St. Jude, the story of my father's death. And I did it uh, for a, a oh boy, a run at, in Chicago. And there's a moment in that play where I talk about the moment when my father dies and then I just cry. This is a theatrical moment. I just start crying and I cry until somebody in the audience takes over. Sometimes people would come up and hug me Sometimes people would hand me a tissue. Uh, another time somebody um, came up and kind of talked while I was weeping. I mean, it was really, really intense experience. That was a performative experience, right? But I will say that the text was done. What I was keeping open was the possibility of what the audience was gonna do. And so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that's a good example of a performance where I kept the fluorescence on, they were waiting for the show to start and the show just kept going, right? And then 45 minutes into it, you're like, oh, okay, this is the show. I am part of the show. I am part of the grieving. I am part of the idea of how death works. And I'm gonna have to participate, if, if nothing else, to watch this guy kind of grieve his father's moment of death. But the, the writing's done. The writing is done. I think it's really important to, to designate when I'm a writer and when I'm the performer. Because if not, I think you can get really lost. And you know, there's always, a, there's always better to do, right? I could have made it better, but I have to stop. That's what I yeah. love about the time in the theater. I love how you get how many weeks and then it's done, right? You got to put it up. Do you feel like the director helps you to act as a dramaturge a little so that you can... Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, you know, I work with Che Yu a lot. And one of the reasons why I work with Che so much is I and I talk about this. Che is a poet. He is a writer. I don't really just have a director in the room. I have another poet in the room. So when he talks to me about language, we are talking a common language here, right? He's he's talking to me about how I'm using words. I love that. I love a director who understands writing too, right? And I love that he's a director who who also was a writer, who still is a writer, right? Because he, in a way, is helping me craft. And I really think of him as a partner, not as a director-writer. I think of him as the co-writer in the room, right? He's very essential for me. He's very important. He's wonderful with edits. I could talk forever. And I love when he says, I wonder if we just already said everything we need to say in that scene. And you're like, yeah. You know, and you want to keep talking, and he's like, you know, no, stop, right? So I love that. Good to see you, my friend. <laughs> Thank you, Melina. Do we want to do one more in the last minute or so? Do you have time? Sure, go for it. Go for it. Awesome, um, Mario. Hi. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to go 
back to the example that you gave earlier about the slices in the pie. Um, I think sometimes we can have so many competing ideas, particularly when we see ourselves again in communities that are affected by so many things that are happening around us in the moment. Um, obviously, right now we're torn between, you know, health issues and racism and government corruption, other things that are all happening. Um, can you just talk a little bit about maybe the things that you found useful and how to narrow down where to find your focus and maybe not be afraid that you're going to lose the ideas if you don't tackle them all at once. So kind of that process of focus on this slice for now and you can come back to the other slice later. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the, the thing I learned from Paula Vogel. It's, I, she's big on the list and I love the list. I have a list in the, in the living room and it's on my wall. It changes according to my interest, but I always have a list, right? I always have the ideas there. And the thing that keeps staying up there is the thing I have to eventually get to. And there's something that keeps sort of winning in the list, which is the thing that I really need to do. So, ver so this is a really important uh, note. The things that I want to do versus the things that I need to do. And I think when you're, you say like what's calling you are the elements of our community, what do you want to deal with, but what do you need to deal with? Because that's very different. That's a different kind of writing. And I will say that as someone who used to throw everything in the pot, I find that um, a getting clear and a beautiful crystallized uh, piece about one idea is a wonderful way of working, right? You get deep inside of it. It's the difference between the one night stand and the getting married, right? Passion grows, passion grows in a play. And so if you don't commit to the passion of the play, you never really know the play. And I think that's really important is I want to get deep inside of that play. I want to marry it and I want to have kids with it and I want to have a life with that play, right? Important. Exactly, thank you so much. What a pleasure to meet you, thank you. Thanks Mario, thanks Luis, it's 6.02. Wow, that was fast. <laughs> yeah. Always so quickly. Thank you. Thank you, you guys, for coming today. Thank you, Luisa Faro, for being a righteous brother, a great writer, a national treasure, and dropping all these pearls of wisdom on us. Um, I saw a lot of people taking notes. So uh, we really, really, really appreciate uh, the wisdom that you've shared with us today and every day through your work. So, and you're welcome to come back anytime you want to hang out with us some more and share some more with us. We would love. Love, love to have you. Um, Thank you. I would love it. And and just to say, I, I uplift you and say, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're such a sweetheart. Well, we'll be back tomorrow. We'll, we'll be back tomorrow. As a reminder, please sign up by 3 p.m. Eastern time every day uh, on the Public Theater website. And I'll send you a link between 3 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Thank SLT. You. Love you. Bye, love you, bye.